pitched him on the idea of starting an undergraduate debate society here at Mizzou. I had no interest whatsoever in starting a debate team, seeing as Mizzou already had one, and I wanted all Mizzou students to have an opportunity to make their voices heard, not just those with prior debating and public, sorry, <laughs> prior debating and public speaking experience. Well, luckily, I wasn't the only one who held such opinions. In the early days of the MDU, I was fortunate to enlist the help of Luke Pittman, our director of outreach, Arvind Kalathil, our social chair, and Justice Voss, our finance chair, who is working diligently on the launch of our website. After meetings with staff members at the Kinder Institute, several revisions and do-overs, and consultations with my family, friends, and fellow Mizzou students, the Missouri Debate Union, or MDU for short, was officially born in 2020. Convenient timing. Modeled after the Oxford Union in the United Kingdom, the MDU's mission is to promote civility, free speech, free expression, critical thought, and scholarly community on the campus of the University of Missouri. This semester, we have several exciting plans, including guest lectures, podcasts, workshops on debating, a yearly publication, and much, much more. While we're excited for the future, it's important that we remain cognizant of the present. As such, for this afternoon's event, I have but one request. Do not be afraid to make your voices heard. Do not be afraid to ask the tough questions. Do not be afraid to go one step further, to delve deeper. Not merely absorbing the information you receive, but also pondering the implications. Do not be afraid to challenge assumptions. And do not recoil if yours are challenged back. Embrace it. The MDU is a community rooted in challenging preconceptions, but more importantly, mutual respect and understanding. We are living during a trying time of division and partisanship. We here at the MDU firmly believe that by engaging with others, sharing our unique perspectives, relishing in our common goals and identity, that we can change the direction of our futures, the direction of this campus, and the future of this country. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our Director of Outreach, Luke Pittman, to introduce this afternoon's guest. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, introduction, Paul. So as Paul said, I am a Chairman of Outreach and a co-founder for the Missouri Debate Union. And today, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing today's speaker. A graduate from the University of Connecticut who received his PhD from Stanford University, a towering figure in the field of economics, a senior fellow with the Cato Institute whose areas of expertise include campaign finance and elections, as I hope you were able to infer from today's event, but also areas of health policy in the media as well. A dedicated researcher, his work has been published in countless academic journals, such as the American Economic Review, the American Journal of Public Health, just to name two of a countless amount. And his work has been cited by such respectable news organizations as the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, and once again, countless others. And of course, he's the chairman of economics department here and a legendary professor at our own University of Missouri. And I cannot stress this enough. If you're majoring in economics, you want to minor in it, or if you're just interested in it, if you have not had Professor Milo, you are doing your education a great disservice, one which I recommend you rectify as soon as possible. And of course, and probably most obvious, he's the author of today's book, Campaign Finance and Today, I'm just gonna talk about the items that have uh, asterisks on them, so you haven't heard it all if, you, uh, if, if you're here today. Um, okay, so, uh, one of the things about money and politics that is, uh, to me, the most striking as, you know, so-called expert in the field is that there are really two uh, pretty firmly held conventional wisdoms about money and politics, and that the, the public and, and the educated public and most pundits and, uh, and uh, um, you know, public-facing experts outside of academia um, have one conventional wisdom, and those of us who study money and politics have, have another conventional wisdom. And um, it, it, it's always struck me um, how different these views are, and part of the motivation for this book is to, is to kind of, you know, sometimes you feel like John the Baptist out, out in the wilderness trying to 
um, um, you know, tell people about the truth that not, not everyone wants to hear. Uh, but we did, um, in order to demonstrate these two different conventional wisdoms, we did a couple of surveys, a, a number of survey questions asked of the general public, and then those same survey questions asked to um, experts in money and politics. And the way we found those experts was, uh, I mean, we could have just listed them ourselves, but we wanted an arm's length approach. So we used Google, Google Scholar searches by year for a variety of keywords, campaign finance, political corruption, campaign spending, et cetera. And then uh, that determined the sample frame. And we had almost a 50% uh, response rate, uh, which is uh, pretty good as these kinds of surveys of experts go. And so uh, let me just show you the result of these, two, of these two surveys, which is when it comes to public concerns about money and politics, I've been saying for years, my sense, and I think it's a fair, um, a, a fair characterization of public concerns about money and politics, is most people think there's too much money in politics, the whole system is corrupt, that elective offices are essentially for sale to the highest bidder, that campaign spending is very effective in determining the outcomes of political races, that campaign contributions are likewise very effective, This basically the equivalent of bribes, that you can affect policy through campaign contributions and lobbying, uh, and as a result, public policy is distorted and unresponsive to the people. This situation is, is something that may, means that you know, normal folks are alienated and we see declining trust in government and participation. And so we desperately need reform in order to restore and preserve the integrity of American democracy. I think this is a fair characterization. And it turns out when you ask the general public questions of this sort, uh, so I don't have the exact verbatim questions here, but the spirit of them, uh, this is the percent agreeing with the statement, too much money in politics, the first column would be for the general public. About 89% of survey respondents over two years, 2,000 person surveys, nationally representative, agree with that statement that there's too much money in politics. And that's 89% agree, there's also disagree and don't know. And, and so that's a, I mean, that's a ridiculously high number. If you've ever done any kind of survey research, you wouldn't get 89% of respondents agreeing with the question, I am taking a survey, All right? So this is really, really high. Um, going down that column, uh, our elective offices for sale to the highest bidder, 75% agree with that. Campaign contributions like bribes, 70%. Um, so you see very high super majorities agreeing and strongly agreeing with what I've characterized as the conventional wisdom about money and politics. And so this is the, you know, this is what forms the basis for a lot of our discussion about money and politics. But look what those, those academic experts, how they're different. And let me say, these academic experts, about 152 of them, I think four admitted to being Trump voters and on the order of 10% to being Republicans. So this is a pretty left-leaning group, which would tend to be very pro-reform. Um, nevertheless, uh, you see very different responses, and particularly about the efficacy of campaign spending and campaign contributions. Only 11% or 7% see them as effective as the, as the public do. There's a very different view about the effectiveness of money in politics uh, among those of us who study it. Uh, nevertheless, you still get a fair number saying too much money in politics or the system is corrupt, but not even a majority. Uh, but you do get a majority still in favor of, of reform. Uh, so there, that's what I mean by there. Are these two very different conventional wisdoms about the role of money in politics, how it actually works. And I want to talk a little bit more uh, about that. Um, uh, but before, let me start with, um, you know, why should we care about public opinion about money in politics? And... Um, there's a legal reason. I mean, there's a there's a you know an obvious political reason. Politicians want to get reelected, so they need to care about what their voters think and respond to it. But from the legal perspective, uh, money in politics forces um, what I characterize as an unfortunate trade-off between the liberal and egalitarian ideals in the Constitution. So we have our First Amendment, free speech, freedom of association, right to petition Congress. That's lobbying. Um, and, and, and so if people are free to do that, they may have unequal influence, which would uh, seem to be inconsistent with the 
more egalitarian notions of one person, one vote, or equal protection of the laws. How can you have equal protection if different people have different impact on, on the laws? Uh, and so there's this natural, in a free society in, in, in the US, there's this natural uh, contradiction embodied in the Constitution. And so it's the role of the Supreme Court to kind of say, well, where are we gonna draw the line? How are we gonna balance these competing values? And the, the, um, the landmark case is Buckley Vallejo in 1976, where the US Supreme Court said that um, the First Amendment protections of, uh, of speech and political association and those rights uh, are, are really you know, almost sacrosanct, that Congress shall make no law, and, and later interpreted state, state legislatures, um, except to prevent the corruption or the appearance of corruption. So you can regulate money in politics, but only for the purpose of preventing corruption or the appearance of corruption, not to make sure different candidates uh, are on equal footing when they're running for office, um, not to try to make sure that a greater diversity of voices is heard. Right? It's really narrowly about corruption and the appearance of corruption, the only justifications for restrictions on um, political speech and association which then begs the question, what is corruption? And again, the courts have been fairly consistent and, and given the existing Supreme Court, um, the, the court is expected to continue to be consistent, uh, at least the majority of the court, that what we mean by corruption is quid pro quo corruption. So actual uh, bribery and influence peddling, not, oh, you support policies that I don't think have good effects, or you support policies that help your, your friends, your, your political friends, um, that's influence. And, and so there's this count, counter theory that corruption is undue influence, and so that money in politics should be regulated to prevent undue influence by moneyed interests. The problem is, as I said, I've been st studying money and politics for over 30 years, I've never once seen a definition of due influence. You know, in practice, undue influence is what other people do and groups that I don't like. It, it's kind of this elastic um, characterization, but it, in, and I call it a modern miasma theory that there's just, you just know it when you see it. It's just out there, undue influence. The majority of the court has not been swayed by those kinds of arguments giving a more you know, loose and ambiguous definition of what corruption is. So for the Supreme Court, corruption is quid pro quo corruption. So cash on the barrel head exchanges, money for favors, um, whether initiated by elected officials or by, by donors. Now, when it comes to um, do campaign finance regulations have any effect on the incidence of actual corruption, I'm just gonna kind of state up front, there's no evidence of it, nobody believes it, nobody actually argues that, that, that campaign finance regulations actually prevent corruption. There's just so many ways you could bribe somebody, you don't have to do it by giving money to their campaign and other ways to peddle influence. So no one makes that argument, so I'm just gonna kind of bypass that and, and just assert there's no systematic evidence uh, in, in favor of that idea that campaign finance regulations actually reduce corruption, which means that everything comes down to the appearance of corruption, and that really is the, the motivation or, or needs to be the motivation for campaign finance reforms in order for them to stand um, uh, up to judicial review. And so this Buckley case from 1976 is the longstanding precedent, and some practical implications of that case is the Buckley court said that government can regulate the financing of campaign speech, so not the content. So the Supreme Court will strike down laws that are directed at so-called truth and advertising in politics. So um, uh, regulation of content is not permitted, although states have tried. Um, and it's the, the financing of campaign speech. We need to define what campaign speech is. Campaign speech, the court again, fairly consistent, 
is explicit advocacy for or against a candidate. So it's not talking about the minimum wage or should we raise taxes or lower taxes. That's issue advocacy. That's something separable. It's vote for this person, vote against that person. That's campaign speech. Of course, one can be a close substitute for the other. Uh, and, and interest groups will often go right up to the line. But issue advocacy is essentially unregulated. Anyone can spend any amount and uh, engaging in issue advocacy. But when it comes to contributions, supporting or opposing candidates, that can be regulated, so-called hard money. Um, government can regulate the source and the size of direct contributions to candidates. So you can prohibit corporate and union contributions to candidates at the federal level. Corporate contributions to candidates have been illegal since 1907, union contributions since I think it's 1947, uh, but it was some years later. Um, individual contributions to candidates are limited but can't be prohibited uh, because of that freedom of association. Uh, public financing is permissible, but it can't be mandatory. You can't tell candidates that they can't go out and raise money and spend it on their campaign. So participation in public financing has to be voluntary. It also means that uh, there are no limits on self-funding by candidates. And so now why would that be? That doesn't seem fair. Some people are rich, some aren't. Well, it's not about fairness, it's about corruption. You can't corrupt yourself with your own money. So there's no corruption rationale to limit how much a candidate can spend on their own campaign. Similarly, no limits on uh, what groups, whether corporations, unions, um, interest groups, individuals, what they spend or how much they spend for or against ballot measures in the state. So if in Missouri we have a ballot measure to increase the minimum wage to $15 an hour, um, it is uh, unconstitutional to try to limit who is going to be spending money for or against that proposition. Why? Because you can't corrupt the text of the proposition. It doesn't change depending on who is supporting it or opposing it. So there's no corruption rationale. So that's important to understand about existing campaign finance laws and sort of the ground rules for reform is they have to be justified in terms of um, this corruption rationale but it becomes uh, much more elastic when you take into consideration the appearance of corruption, because now that's all about what people think is corrupt. And so that is often how campaign finance reforms are advocated for, that these are going to improve trust and confidence in government or people's views of government, even if they don't necessarily reduce actual corruption. Uh, an important one we should talk about are independent expenditures. And this is the uh, infamous Citizens United case had to do with independent expenditures. Uh, it was always the case that individuals could spend unlimited amounts of money to advocate for or against a candidate. Those were independent expenditures going back to the 70s. Um, it was actually not part of the law, but a, um, uh, my understanding is a regulatory rule made by the Federal Election Commission that unions and corporations could not engage in independent expenditures. And uh, what an independent expenditure is, rather than giving money to a candidate, I'm gonna run my own ads and I'm not coordinating with the candidate. That's an independent expenditure. Individuals always had the right to do that and to spend unlimited amounts. Uh, they tend not to because not many individuals are you know, so arrogant that they think they're gonna do a good job at that. They'd rather give it to the party or to a candidate. Uh, but around 2010, the Supreme Court heard a case, and if you're not familiar, it was a group, Citizens United, that created a pay-per-view movie, uh, Hillary the Movie. And it was basically bad stuff about Hillary Clinton. And, uh, and so um, the Federal Election Commission uh, said, you can't do this, you're a corporation, albeit a nonprofit corporation, Citizens United, and you are engaging in campaign speech, a candidate for office, you're saying bad things about her, that's express advocacy, that violates the prohibition on corporate spending. And um, during the initial um, hearing of that case, the um, uh, solicitor for the government, Elena Kagan, 
uh, actually argued that the federal government could prohibit the publication of, um, of books or movies if they engaged in advocacy regarding federal candidates. And so the Supreme Court said, whoa, this is kind of a big deal. We're going to stop and we're going to pick this up in September and, and hear this case at length and, and focus on it. So Citizens United um, it was a very important case. The Supreme Court uh, considered it um, uh, at length. And, um, and the, the justification for the decision, which is that the federal government may not prohibit corporations, unions, or other groups from spending as much as they want on independent expenditures is because they're independent, there's already no concern about quid pro quo corruption. Quid pro quo corruption is about cash on the barrel head exchanges with a candidate. But you still want to have free speech. And so longstanding precedent, the Supreme Court has said, if you're engaging in independent political activities, that's OK. Not that it's not possible to engage in exchanges, but you've got to somehow balance free speech and concerns about corruption. Um, it's a short hop and a skip from Citizens United to super PACs, which you may have heard of. And full disclosure, I was an expert witness um, against the government uh, on the other side uh, uh, for the cause of freedom uh, in the uh, case that was, um, I can't even remember the name of the case, but it, it was um, uh, the case that basically made clear that you could have so-called super PACs. What a super PAC is, is it's a group of people who pool resources to engage in independent expenditures. So Citizens United just said, just as an individual can engage in independent expenditures, so can a corporation or a union. Um, uh, the uh, subsequent uh, case that I was an expert in argued, well, given that, groups of people can pool their resources unlimited contributions to a super PAC that then engages in independent advocacy for or against a candidate. If one is legal, then that should be legal too. If there's not a corruption, anti-corruption rationale to prevent independent expenditures, people should be allowed to uh, associate in this way. So those are super PACs, and super PACs are by far the biggest source of independent um, expenditures. Um, okay, I want to move along a bit here. Um, and I'm happy to answer more questions about actual laws and, and reforms that we see in place. And I should say, just about everything I'm talking about uh, for the next several slides has to do with uh, federal law and federal elections. Each state has its own rules for uh, regulating gubernatorial elections, state legislative elections, et cetera. But we'll focus on the federal level for now. Um, if you're interested in learning more about corruption, I just included this slide, and I can I can send you references. But I do have some uh, some work in progress. It's a, it's a subject of a whole other talk, which is what are the determinants of corruption among elected politicians, and uh, how do reforms um, affect that? And the bottom line finding is state campaign finance laws don't have any impact on the incidence of corruption among state legislators. And there's, as I said, no other systematic or scientific evidence to suggest that actual corruption is influenced by reforms. So the end of this overlong introduction is that um, campaign finance regulations must be narrowly tailored to prevent corruption or the appearance of corruption. There's no evidence that campaign finance regulations prevent actual corruption. So everything hinges on what the public thinks about money and politics and the effects of reform. That is the main you know, rationale for having reform. And that's why we care about public opinion. OK, now I shared with you that conventional wisdom. And again, by way of background, I just want to say much of the public's conventional wisdom about money and politics is either not well supported or, or, or maybe better said, not, not always logically consistent or coherent. So what about this notion that there's too much money in politics? Well, we broke all records with this most recent election cycle. Uh, estimates as high as, these are the high-end estimates, about 14 billion spent in the 2020 federal election cycle. Uh, that's about $70 per vote, given the number of votes in the general election. Of course, that's a two-year election cycle. 
and there were primaries and other things going on. Um, you know, is that a lot? Well, it's about 0.03% of gross domestic product over that time period. So I'm not sure it's a lot if you're thinking about, you know, control of the last remaining uh, superpower and, uh, you know, uh, uh, richest nation on earth by many measures. Um, I'm not sure 0.03% of GDP is a lot of money. It is less than we spend on potato chips, take it or leave it. I don't know if that's a relevant comparison, but 14 billion sounds like a lot, but there's a lot of dollars in the US, and so it's not a lot from that kind of perspective. It is true, though, that corrected for inflation, campaign spending has generally been increasing um, since World War II, and it does appear to be driven primarily by growth in personal income and political competition. And these last 20 years, so you've grown up in an era of heightened political corruption, which is unusual. In my experience, when I was your age, the House of Representatives had been controlled by Democrats almost in an unbroken spring, uh, string for 40 years. Uh, and so the kind of competition and change and control of the House and the Senate uh, and really close presidential election contests. This is unusual these last 20 years. And with that heightened competition has come an increase in campaign spending. I haven't, in, I haven't not updated this for 2018 and 20, but you get the idea that inflation adjusted campaign spending, the solid line is increasing and it seesaws because in the midterms there's less spending than in the presidential election cycle. Uh, so that is increasing. The dotted line is independent expenditures. And in 2016, the independent expenditures uh, from super PACs, from parties, from all groups, um, were about 15% of total spending. This last election cycle, it's probably closer to 25%, 20 to 25%, but not the majority of campaign spending. Uh, a little bit on the, that non-candidate spending. Um, back in the two th uh, around 2000, in the 1990s, the, the bugaboo of campaign finance reformers was so-called soft money. At that time, anyone could give any amount of money to a political party, and then the parties could turn around and support their candidates. That was soft money. And it was not regulated until 2002 was the passage of the McCain-Feingold Act. And so soft money was uh, rising over time through the 90s. And then that spigot turns off in 2002. And we've got a few years in the interim, but really the spigot opens back up with the 2010 Citizens United decision. And now anyone can give any amount to a super PAC to engage in independent expenditures. So where does, you know, those big piles of interested money, where do they go? Before 2002, they went to the national political parties. After 2010, it goes to super PACs that are basically quasi parties now. They're doing what the parties used to do, but just in a less coordinated fashion. And as an aside, there's a lot of political scientists who now looking back say, maybe that 2002 reform wasn't such a smart idea because political parties, you know, pl we think play an important and legitimate role in American politics. Uh, and now they've been supplanted by these quasi party organizations. And, and, um, and so that's a subject for another day, whether that uh, unintended consequence of the McCain-Feingold Act was a, was a good idea or not a good idea. Those super PACs though, and uh, sometimes people talk about dark money, super PACs, independent expenditures, uh, people have a very uh, exaggerated notion of how important super PACs are in American politics. So this is just from some of our um, survey work. We asked people about what percent of all campaign spending is attributable to super PACs. And back in 2016, the right answer is about 16%. And you can see, even with a generous curve, only 4% of respondents can get that right. Most people think, and given the media coverage, who can blame them? Uh, most people think that super PACs are responsible for 50%, 75% or more of political spending, and that's just, just not the case. Okay. Um, however, um, you know, it is true that 
income and wealth inequality translates into inequality in political giving. And so just um, these numbers are from around 2016 as well. Um, we know there's income inequality. The top 1% of households earn about 20% of total income. Uh, in inequality is even greater if you look at wealth rather than just income. Uh, and in the 2016 federal elections, less than 1% of the voting age population gave as much as $200 to a candidate. Um, the reason $200 is a threshold is that's the threshold for disclosure. Um, so if you give $199 to a candidate, they don't have to report your name, address, and employer. If you give $200 in a federal election, they have to report your name, address, and employer, and it's public information, and you can look up who gives to whom. Um, and so that's why we use that threshold. But most people, you know, don't give their money to politicians. They have better uses for it. Uh, and, and so the top 1% of donors account for about 75% of all political spending. So there is a lot of, uh, the, the inequality in wealth and income is magnified when you look at who gives and how much they give. An interesting study, this wealth elasticity of donations, what that means is that the wealthy give basically a constant percentage of their wealth to politicians. And so you could think of it, you know, my wife and I, we try to tithe, try to give 10% of our income to charity. For the wealthy, they give essentially a, fact, a fixed percentage of their wealth to politicians. So when stock market goes up, more money flowing into politics and stock market goes down, less money. Um, okay, back to that conventional wisdom. So this is still in the area of kind of a long introduction contrasting the conventional wisdom among the public with, with why it is experts in money and politics have a different view. Um, so are elections for sale? Well, it is true that winning candidates spend much more than losing candidates. It is true that most incumbents uh, win re-election. And so that's, those are correlations that suggest campaign spending is very um, important. However, when we try to estimate the causal effect of campaign spending, what we find is um, that the, there's strongly diminishing marginal productivity of campaign spending. And so what I mean by that is if, if I were to run for office, um, nobody would vote for me. Maybe I'll get 1% of the vote. Uh, if I spend a lot of money, I might go from 1% to 5%. And if I spend a lot more, maybe I can get up to 9%, but it's gonna be a diminishing marginal effect. And so when you're talking about among the sample of professional candidates who have been endorsed by political parties and have connections um, to allies, um, whether they're in interest groups or in their own party, um, the marginal effects of campaign spending tend to be very, very small. So small that we often can't find a statistically significant effect of marginal campaign spending. So one way to think about it is um, the, the eff effectiveness of campaign advertising diminishes as you engage in more and more. And in most races in the US, we're way out on the flat of the curve. And so that can, you know, take the special election in Georgia, you know, over $100 million spent. Another million dollars wasn't gonna change the outcome of that race. Um, and you know whose mind is going to change after they've been bombarded with thousands of ads by being hit with another hundred ads? Uh, it's just not that effective at the margin. So this is among that sample of of contested races, especially. It's well known that marginal campaign spending not that effective, and that means that politicians are probably not that grateful for a contribution because it's not really affecting their probability of getting elected very much. Uh, it also means that campaign finance reforms, this is a study that just came out this summer um, with a PhD student, former PhD student in our political science department. We looked at state campaign finance reforms over um, about a 40 year period to try to understand whether uh, restrictions on campaign contributions or the adoption of public financing, are those pro-competitive or are they anti-competitive? And what we found was 
largely no effects on the outcomes of races, uh, but, but some perverse findings. So uh, restrictions on independent expenditures, which states could have had before 2010, um, it turns out that those restrictions are very pro-incumbent. And, and the reason that is, is so few challengers win. They don't have name recognition, et cetera. They really need to make a Herculean effort, and that means raising and spending a lot of money. So anything that limits campaign spending is, tends to be pro-incumbent and reduce competition. Okay, our campaign contributions like bribes. Again, there's a large literature here. And it's certainly true that patterns of special interest giving are such that it is consistent with the idea that campaign contributions are like bribes. What industries form political action committees uh, or engage in lobbying? Heavily regulated industries or industries where uh, government contracts are really important. Who do they give money to? Who do they try to talk to? Uh, members of state legislatures and Congress who sit on committees that have jurisdictions over the policies they care about. Right? All that's consistent with campaign contributions are like bribes. Uh, the problem is campaign contributions in most jurisdictions are, are limited. And uh, so at the federal level, political action committees, corporate political action committees have to raise money from individuals. It's not corporate treasury money. They have to raise money from individual employees and managers and in limited amounts. And then they can only give $5,000 per election to a federal candidate. Not a lot of money when the marginal effect of a million dollars is almost nothing. So uh, the amounts of money, it turns out, in the aggregate, that, um, that interested groups give to candidates is, uh, is so small that uh, sometimes you see these sort of exercises where people say, ah, Exxon gave um, $60,000 to Senator X over the last 15 years, and sure enough, Senator X voted for this tax reform that gives Exxon $30 million in additional tax write-offs. Well, think about what the rate of return is on that investment. If you could make that kind of rate of return, you wouldn't work, you'd just buy politicians and buy favors. The, the idea that that rate of return is so high suggests that it's not actually a rate of return, right? Because money would flow until that rate of return comes down to a normal rate of return. You know, it's more like 6%. Um, so not a lot of money is actually uh, given, and the best estimates of what is the causal effect of a political action committee contribution on a roll call vote is, uh, again, not statistically significant, approximately zero. So 20 years ago, uh, some buddies of mine wrote this paper titled, Why is there so little money in US politics that makes this argument? Um, and, um, uh, you know, so why isn't there a market for political favors? Well, politicians don't really have a property right to sell promises, right? It's legislation is a collective good, and just because a law passes this year doesn't mean it can't be undone next year, plus the amounts of money are limited. So there really isn't this kind of cash on the barrel head market for political favors in the U.S. that the public conventional wisdom seems to seems to think. Um, I want to jump ahead. There's other evidence I could point to, but I'm going to have to argue from expertise here. Um, this one's worth mentioning. Uh, so you could look at the McCain-Feingold uh, reform as a surprise. So if you think that campaign contributions are like bribes, then back when corporations could give unlimited amounts to the national party leaders, that's when they could really buy policy. And so it wasn't sure whether the Supreme Court would uphold McCain-Feingold. It's, it's gonna be kind of a surprise. So if you're an investor and you think campaign contributions are like bribes, they're really important to the bottom line of politically active corporations, highly regulated corporations, defense firms. In the era before McCain-Feingold, um, uh, you're saying, ah, well, the reason they're profitable is because they're so influential in politics. But after McCain-Feingold, they can no longer give unlimited amounts of money to national party leaders. That spigot turns off. 
that should really affect the bottom line of those firms. So we call it an event study. You can look at the stock prices of those firms, the politically active, publicly traded corporations. Is there some impact on their stock price before and after the Supreme Court announces its decision? Absolutely nothing. Financial markets put zero weight on those kinds of activities. And there's other studies of that, of that sort. Um, and this is actually a very readable review of a number of those kinds of studies. Okay, so what are this, this kind of background lessons? If we're gonna talk about money and politics, we, we should be informed about some of the social science. The background lessons, uh, campaign spending does not drive electoral outcomes to the degree that many people fear. That's actually not saying much because the conventional wisdom is so ridiculously exaggerated like Luke's introduction of me. Um, and uh, campaign contributions and lobbying are not nearly as influential as many people fear. Again, it's because the public conventional wisdom is so exaggerated. Okay. Um, there's also not evidence that campaign spending alienate voters. If we look at in the races where there's a lot of political advertising and then you survey people, guess what? They know more about the candidates. They know what issues the candidates support or oppose. It's advertising people. They're more informed. Uh, and so shouldn't be surprising. Um, okay, finally now, um, and that's a summary of kind of decades of, of, of research, so I've taken some liberties in that, in that summary. But less attention has been spent on what I think is the central policy question, which is do campaign reforms uh, increase public trust in government? That's how they're always sold. And and they're sold that way because of the, the Buckley case. Um, and, uh, and so what we do to test this is we look at the state level, because at the national level, the data is not as uh, informative about causality as we'd like. So one thing you can do, you can ask people, do you trust the federal government to do the right thing? That's kind of a standard opinion survey. And 30% of the population says hardly ever, just about 2%, just about always. How widespread is corruption in the federal government? 60% of people think it's widespread, right? So people think they're living in, um, you know, in uh, some really disreputable um, um, uh, country ruled by a very corrupt government if you look at opinion surveys. But then if you ask people, is it possible to address the problem of corruption through campaign finance reform? And we've also asked this question more broadly through ethics reform. And uh, more people say no than yes, which suggests that it's not necessarily about the money in politics, it's people just don't like politics and politicians. Um, okay. This is trust in government over time. Uh, before and after Citizens United. So if you listen to politicians and reformers, Citizens United was like the worst thing that ever happened. Of course, that was before President Trump came along. But if, if you listen to these folks at the time, Citizens United was the worst thing that ever happened. And, uh, and so it really led to a decline in trust in government. So the solid line is for all respondents to survey questions about trust in the federal government. And it's low, uh, only about 10% have, uh, have a high amount of trust. But it's actually, if anything, increasing over time. And there's no sharp break around 2010. And then we split it out by Democrats and Republicans. And you do see sharp breaks. But it's not about Citizens United. It's about who won the election in 2008. That was Obama. And so all of a sudden, Democrats say, hey, yay, federal government. We like the federal government. We trust it. And Republicans say, boo, federal government. We don't like it. And then just the reverse in 2016, the parties crisscross again. So uh, people's notions about trust and confidence in government are driven by their political leanings. But they're not, you know, just from the national data, don't seem to be related to um, the Citizens United decision, the way in which many people think. But that's not a particularly fancy analysis, so it shouldn't be too compelling because other things are changing. So in order to test the proposition of whether campaign finance reforms work in practice, and I'm focusing narrowly on that public trust and confidence in government, um, what we did here, collected survey data from over 50 surveys over a 30-year period, 
And over that period, there's a lot of changes in state laws. And all of these surveys ask people about their trust and confidence in state government. And then there's also questions about you know, what party they lean toward, et cetera. So we can control for other factors. And so think of this as a, like a laboratory experiment. You've got some states that adopt more restrictive reforms, some states that liberalize, some states where there were no changes, that's your control. So you've got different treatments and control. And these changes are taking place at different times, so that's a way to disentangle the effects of changes in campaign finance regulatory regimes from other national trends, like do you trust government or not? And we can control for those partisan factors as well. And so the, that analysis, when we do that, uh, we're taking a, a advantage of the, the fact that there's a lot of changes in state laws. So if you look at the number of states over time that limit contributions to candidates from corporations, it goes from about 34 states in 1987 to 45 states in 2017. And so those changes become part of our experiment. What are the effects of those changes? Similarly, increases in the number of states that limit contributions to individuals. Now at the federal level, these have been regulated since the mid-70s. Um, uh, lim contributions from individuals, but many states don't, didn't, uh, and several still don't limit contributions from individuals. <clears throat> then you also have some states with different uh, public financing regimes, either just for gubernatorial candidates or for state legislative candidates as well. And so it was just a handful of states back in the 80s but now we're up to about a dozen states that have some sort of public financing. You might be aware HR1 uh, being considered by Congress would establish some um, uh, additional public financing for congressional elections. Um, states with bans on independent expenditures by corporations. So that was allowed before 2010. And you can see that was a reform that was sort of um, becoming more popular. Um, so by 2007, about 23 states banned corporate independent expenditures, but after Citizens United, nobody can ban that. And so that's a big change. So there's a number of changes over time in state campaign finance laws. And so then we can look at our data on trust and confidence in state government. And to make it comparable across surveys, we put it on a 100-point scale. And there's a lot of numbers there. This is just to convince you that I'm an expert. Um, that uh, the important number is the mean trust and confidence in state governments about 45 on this 100 point scale and um, the standard deviation is about 20 points. So if you're thinking of an effect as big or not, often we say is it one standard deviation or bigger or smaller. So mean about 45, standard deviation about 20. Uh, and this is a fancy regression, and if you're familiar with uh, regression analysis, we put asterisks on statistically significant effects. And so the only asterisks associated with campaign finance regulations, those first five rows, we get the wrong sign. Uh, so looking at the second column, uh, regime one, this is a state adopts a limit on corporate contributions. What does that do? What's the causal effect on trust and confidence in state government? It goes down by 1.88 points on a 100-point scale with a standard deviation of 20. This is a tiny effect, but it goes contrary to the argument of reformers and, and so on. Basically, what we find are, are tiny effects that are either not statistically significant or they go in the opposite direction as is typically claimed. That various reforms increase trust and confidence in government. So uh, the fact that those numbers are small uh, and or not significant is all to take from that, uh, from that analysis. Now, that, that analysis is in the nature of comparing trust and confidence in state government before a reform to trust and confidence in state government after a reform. Think of it as the average before over time in a state compared to the average after. What if something like this was happening? So in a particular state, trust and confidence in government is declining leading up to year zero is when a reform is implemented, and then it increases. Well, if you just compare the average before and after, it will look like nothing happened or even trust went down. 
So you need to make sure you're not having these time effects associated with reform. The effects of reform might be gradual uh, and they might not be instantaneous. So we do that kind of analysis and this is in our book and um, the solid lines are the point estimates, the dotted lines are the standard errors. The thing to take away is we look for different types of reforms, limits on corporate contributions to candidates, limits on individual contributions, public financing, gubernatorial or legislative. Some states have so-called clean election laws, Arizona, Maine, Connecticut, um, where they have full public finance of, of candidates. And then we also look before and after Citizens United. None of these show that kind of V shape where trust was declining, then you have a reform, then it's increasing. So on average, no effect. In fact, nothing's going on. And given what I've said, this should now be not so surprising because what affects your trust and confidence in government, whether your party is in control or not, not necessarily how much is being, being spent. Um, so lessons from this kind of literature. Um, campaign finance regulations are an ineffective tool for improving trust and confidence in government, despite what many people believe. Uh, and in our book, we, vis we describe it as uh, eviscerating a pillar of campaign finance jurisprudence because the courts have assumed that various regulations will improve trust and confidence in government. And there's no empirical support for that. I also put up that quote because this was our biggest argument between my co-author and myself. I, I hold that you cannot eviscerate a pillar, but he liked it, so 